Today's first scripture is taken from Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but empty, taking the form of a slave, assuming human likeness. And being found in appearance as human, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God, God exalted him even more highly. He gave him the name that is above every other name. So that in the name given to Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. The second scripture is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage of Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed him to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. May the Holy Spirit break them open and bring them new life and new meaning. Will you join me in prayer? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. You who are our rock, our redeemer, you who saves. Amen. So we are truly, officially on the road to Easter. It may look like winter out there. It may feel like winter out there, but truly it is spring. It may feel like death surrounds you, but truly there is new life emerging everywhere you look, including within your own life and your own heart. Traversing and travailing much in labor together these past five weeks, this being our sixth Sunday in Lent, we have sought to accompany Jesus on the road to Easter. Today's Gospel reading takes us en route with Jesus and those who traveled with him along the rugged and steep 15-mile walk from Jericho to Jerusalem. It was a tough and long road. Today on this Palm Sunday, we recall Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And yet the juxtaposition because in days from now, we also know that we stand on the precipice of Holy Week, that we stand in the shadow of the cross. Now keep in mind, back to the trek on Palm Sunday, that any trip to Jerusalem in Jesus' day was really a revival. It revived national hopes 
that were fanned by good memories of the good old days, of the grand old days, a trip to a triumphant victory, and frequented by royalty. That's the kind of parade the people had seared in their minds and hearts. So waving him on with shouts of Hosanna, 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 meaning God saves in Hebrew, the people lined the roads and ushered their new king into the city. The very one who would save them, right? The very one who would rescue them from all political burdens of their days. All too soon, however, they would find out that this king of kings was not there to solve their political infighting. Rather, this one who came in the name of the Lord was there to save their souls. But for the moment, it was their king that they sought, their king that they welcomed, their king for whom they lined the streets and laid branches upon the ground in his honor. But many of them must have thought, what kind of king would ride in upon a donkey? A beast of burden, mind you. The transport that is used by commoners and most especially by the lowly and the slaves of those days. There was this high white horse that they were accustomed to seeing royalty ride upon into Jerusalem. So who was this Jesus, they asked themselves, as others shouted their hosannas, the equivalent to a national hail to the chief. This was a very, very strange reign, this reign of Christ, a reign that had been predicted so long ago in the Hebrew scriptures, one that had been prophesied through the ancient soothsayers, speaking of a king who is to come humble and mounted on a donkey. One who would be anointed, the Holy One, the Anointed One, the Royal One, who would save the people, indeed, and he would, but not in the way that they or one of us might expect. So let's think about this, 2024. Let's think about our lifetime, the span of most of our lifetimes here. When you think of royalty, who or what comes to mind right now, right here in this generation? Maybe for some it is the late Queen of England, or maybe perhaps it was the late Princess of Wales, who among us back in those days in some ways was not captivated by her seemingly charmed life, her elegant fashion and style, and royal surroundings. Now Diana was the picture of royalty, worldly royalty. Etched in my mind forever, and perhaps you may have seen this as well, is the unforgettable photograph of an extraordinarily tall and beautiful and elegant and well-dressed Diana standing next to a very hunched over, tiny framed woman. She didn't reach five feet, dressed in peasant cloth from head to foot, none other than Mother Teresa, who for some unknown, or perhaps in God's world, God knows, I have been blessed to meet before she passed away. She came up to here and was completely hunched over, and her eyes could pierce right into your soul. The juxtaposition between these two was startling. Here before our eyes was captured on film the 
the epitome of worldly royalty, one in a most unusual and expected form, regal, beautiful, composed, elegant, and the other in the form of a peasant who had denied herself of any and all worldly comforts and trappings very consciously from a very early age. And yet here were the two side by side, reaching out to those in segments of the world population in ways that no other person could have done. They were both ministering. Diana married into royalty, and Mother Teresa fled from it. Here is the story that tells of the brother of Mother Teresa as he was preparing himself to become an officer in the Albanian army. You all know she's from Albania, or you do now. Just before his graduation, he stopped and he visited with his family and his sister of 17 years old, whose name was Gonxha, G-O-N-X-H-A, later to become Sister Teresa, later to become Mother Teresa, and in our time we can say later to become Saint Teresa, was present at the family table. The brother told of his appointment upon graduation to be a junior officer at the palace of the King of Albania, and what a good step for his career this would be. He turned to his sister and said, so what will you be doing? And she said, at 17, I have chosen to follow Christ to India. And I've chosen to give my life to serving the poorest of the poor. Her brother was engaged. To have a sister doing such an unworthy thing will be a great embarrassment to me and even an impediment to my career. Are you out of your mind? We've heard that question before. Yes. Yes, Mother Teresa was out of her mind because she had the mind, the very mind of Christ. She knew that the examples that her beloved Jesus had placed before her were ones of deep humility, of lowliness, of service, of sacrifice, and of ultimate pure joy. She knew that the one that she called Lord and Savior, teacher and brother, had given royalty a whole new look. Not of power or rulership or luxury, rather one that had identified with the poor, with the outcast, with the handicapped, with the lowly, with the commoner, with the slave. Today's scripture that was read here so beautifully this morning, taken from Philippians, tells us that Jesus, who though was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God. But he emptied himself in the form of one who serves, and he humbled himself, knowing that the only way through and with anything or anyone was the way of love. And he became obedient to God to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus' triumphal ride into Jerusalem was a ride into death, and he knew it. He was walking the walk for all humanity for all in each and every one of us. Jesus did not fulfill the people's expectations. Boy, was he a disappointment. He didn't satisfy popular messianic hopes or toe the socio-political line. This, after all, was not the royal king that they had expected. Soon, soon, oh, so soon, their hosannas, would turn to shouts of crucify him, crucify him. 
Soon, everyone would turn on him and conspire, or at least listen up, at least cooperate through complicity, through silence, through not speaking up, and being passive, one who colludes. Jesus' death, however, would not be a death that would have the final say, thanks be to God. His lowly humility would be lift, uplifted and exalted by God, and his slavery would set all of humanity free. This is the true definition of royalty, one who has true and ultimate authority not over others, not ruling it over one another, rather over one's self, through self-emptying. Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my ways, test me, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and forgive me, and lead me in the way everlasting self-emptying, through being out of his own mind and one with God's mind. Jesus taught us through his life and through his ministry, through his death, through his resurrection, that true authority is not ours until we give it completely over to God. That's true royal royalty. And true royalty does not exist apart from humble servanthood. And that true life cannot occur until one learns to die to one's self in order to be risen and live for God and to find that there's extraordinary freedom and joy in that. My friends, may we turn toward the cross during this holy week and seek to be emptied so that we in turn may truly be filled with the living, breathing, resurrected, holy God through Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Oh God, we praise you for the example set before us in Jesus Christ. Please forgive our fickle ways when we too are welcoming you in with shouts of Hosanna in one breath, only to turn with words of condemnation and criticize and reject the next. We pray that we empty ourselves before you so that you may be the true author, the true authority of our lives, of our community, of our church, of our country, of our world. We seek to stay close to you through the shadow of the cross onto the victory of Easter morning. Sometimes we get sleepy like the disciples, and sometimes we fall asleep. And you love us still. May we be true in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>